Good morning, folks. It is Labor Day 2022. Welcome back to the Philosophy for Philistines channel with your host, Bill Reimer. This channel is also known as Politics for Plebeians, and since I am a plebeian and a laborer, I'm going to engage you today in a little uh, test. I want to read to you a paper written by a professor from York University on critical theory. Since I most often, well not most often, but very often I speak about postmodernism, which is the bastard cousin of critical theory, but I want you to hear the words of those who are actually teaching our children here in Ontario. The article is on Wiley Constellations. I'll happily forward it to any of you who wish it. It is entitled Seriousness, Not All That Serious, Utopia Beyond Realism and Normativity in a Contemporary Critical Theory. Written by S.D. Krostowska, who is a professor at York University in Toronto, Canada, in the Department of Humanities. Everything real has a horizon, they quote by Ernest Bloch. Philosophy contains a playful element, which the traditional view of it as a science would like to exorcise. The unnaive thinker knows how far he remains from the object of his thinking, and yet he must always talk as if he headed in entirely. Head it entirely. This brings him to the point of clowning. He must not, not deny his clownish traits, least of all, since they alone can give him hope for what is denied him. Philosophy is the most serious of things, but then again, it is not all that serious. And that's a quote from Theodore Adorno, who is one of the fathers of critical theory. First chapter. In the wake of the crisis of the left and the widespread suspicion of models of social progress, third-generation critical theorists finally began to engage with the utopian legacy of the early Frankfurt School, an inheritance that, while welcomed elsewhere in the humanities and social sciences, was downplayed by their direct second-generation predecessors. Avoiding the extremes of, on one hand, Max Horkheimer's 1937 program of the aggressive critique of utopian tendencies within its own household, Horkheimer, 1972, page 2006, 216, and on the other hand, their unreflected or reluctant accommodation, critical theory in the Frankfurt School, has come around to seeing utopianism as vital to putting its house in order. In reclaiming this utopian heritage, theorists have taken up the challenge that lies beyond political realism with its strict attention to political realities and normative thinking with its elaboration of ideals and normative principles for action. These challenges, these challenge cons this challenge consists in clarifying what makes such critical and speculative activity meaningful or possible in the first place. It seems clear, oh yes, as clear as crystal to me, that, that some version of utopia, remember utopia means no place, express hope or longing for a better world not only motivates social criticism but also conditions any emphatic or strong normativity. The question still open is how such a conception of utopia can transcend the oscillation between realist and normative commitments without betraying them. My contention here is that a measure of utopian access or surplus to invoke above all Ernst Bloch is indispensable to critical theory's political efficacy. In other words, what they advocate doesn't have to have any reference to reality or any basis in fact or any historical validity. 
I'm not making this up. I'm merely reading the article. Post, I'll post it below. You tell me what you think. Without it, a body of work will continue to disappoint those readers who, at a time of crisis, find unsatisfactory the remnants of utopia in Jürgen Habermas's thought and seek a way to some utopian uplands beyond the black forest of negative dialectics where they had followed Ordorno. And that's from Matthews 2017, in 2017, page 111. A survey of positions developed by Sela Ben Habib, Raymond Geis, Rainer Forst, Maeve Cook, and Amy Allen shows utopia to be reconcilable with critical series normative and realistic commitments, realist commitments. To be sure, Ben Habib's enforced normative concern around the integration, indeed necessity, of utopian thinking in a critical theory of the present and Geiss's leveraging of utopia against wishful thinking to argue its consistency with political realism differ in important ways. Yet a bird's eye view of utopia and critical theory today reveals, for the most part, not an island, but a landlocked republic. This utopian thought reduced, for better or worse, to a province of critical theory. Disentangling utopia conceptually from the divans of normativity and realism, uh, referred to in part three and part four, shows how it may designate something more than theory's dimension or element. This return to utopia as the making and remaking of the mind's horizons, inspiring and educating hope amidst justified despair and the threat of catastrophe. Notice the, the radical types can't ever talk about anything other than in catastrophic terms if we don't listen to them. Everything will be a catastrophe unless they're... they're their word salads are adhered to. I can't even understand them, let alone adhere to them. Need not involve straying very far. It may mean no more than a return to it as a dialectical impulse, like the an that animating the thought or certain founders of critical theory, and more recently championed by the French political uh, philosopher Miguel Abensor. Utopia's radical emancipatory potential has been of long-standing interest to Selah Ben Habib in her 1986 reconstruction of the Frankfurt School tradition, calling for going beyond regulative ideas like justice and freedom and reviving Bloch's idea of a concrete utopia. Everything they refer to is as though it's made in stone. Imminent projections of a good society grounded in historical realities and real possibilities. Transformative visions possessed with the power of anticipation. Such an utopia is no longer utopian, she concludes, without paradox. Without paradox? Jesus. For it's not a mere beyond. It is a negation of the ex existent in the name of a future that bursts open the possibilities of the present. Benabib, 1986, page 353. Despite having successfully overcome the exotericism of Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno's ideal of utopian reason from pages 329 uh, and 227, the reigning Habermasian model of communicative rationality was, according to Ben Habib, not enough for an emancipatory break to occur. On page 227, since his model of social progress rooted in communicative ethics was insufficient for anticipatory utopian critique of the present, this being for her one of the two dimensions or functions of critical theory, page 142, more than just rejecting the messianic utopianism of Bloch and Benjamin, Habermas overcorrected for the self-consciously apparatic 
utopianism of his predecessors Adorno and Herkheimer, voiding his vision of utopian potentials from page 328, 345, 227, critique Ben Habib reminds us must not only explain and diagnose as per critical theory's other explanatory diagnosis dimension, but also aspire to something more than universalist normativity, that something was intersubjective association leading beyond the polity of, polity of rights and entitlements, the goal of politics of fulfillment, to a community of needs and solidarity. Pursued via a politics of transfiguration, affecting a utopian break with aspects of the present, from pages 351, 13, and 336, as is clear in his title, Ben Habib's Critique, Norm, and Utopia, conceptually differentiates terms that, though they were essentially in tension, ought to be linked as complementary and constitute, constitutive moments of critical theory of society or as the poles between which such theory can unfold, from page 13 and 328, Without utopia, then the power of criticism and normativity collapses. I'm going to stop reading there because I have no idea what I just read. Do you? Worse than this word salad of baffle gab, I have educated people that I've known since childhood, who have the unmitigated temerity to tell me that critical theory doesn't exist, that it's an alt-right conspiracy theory, that it has no influence on society today, even though we can see it's being taught at York University using our taxes to pay for students to learn this nihilistic tripe, who, the entire goal of which, of course, is to tear down normativity and to label the most successful and free societies that have ever existed as patriarchal tyrannies and inherently racist and oppressive, even though it was in Canada that the most liberal government of its day existed, that passed a first act preventing slavery to get its ugly toehold here, and that my own city was involved in freeing slaves that Harriet Tubman lived in my town. They completely ignore the long history, the long struggle for personal autonomy and individual freedom so you tell me your thoughts and be aware that this is the tripe that they're teaching your children. God bless you. Have a wonderful Labor Day.